नमस्कार ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आई जी एन सी ए इट इंडीड ए ग्रेट प्लेजर इन एक्सटेंडिंग ए वेरी हार्टी वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू इन टूडेज बुक लॉन्च एंड डिस्कशन प्रोग्राम ऑफ द बुक एथनो मेडिशन एंड ट्राइबल हीलिंग प्रैक्टिस इन इंडिया रिटर्न बाई डॉक्टर सुनीता रेडी एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन जवाहरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी एंड पब्लिश बाई स्प्रिंगर एंड एंथ्रोपोस फाउंडेशन आई जी एन सी अंडर आई जी एन सी वर्क बुक सर्किल प्रोग्राम ऑर्गेनाइज बुक डिस्कशन एंड लॉन्च एटलीस्ट टू टू थ्री एवरी मंथ टूडे टू डू दिस ऑनर ऑफ लॉन्चिंग द बुक एंड गाइडिंग एस अबाउट मोर अबाउट द बुक एंड सब्जेक्ट ऑफ द बुक वी हैव वेरी एमिनेंट गेस्ट इट्स इंडीड माई प्लेजर इन एक्सटेंडिंग ए वेरी हार्टी वेलकम टू all of them kalanidhi division which is which is a uh, containing this all valuable knowledge resources open to everybody you can come any time and uh, uh, benefit out of that and in that series uh, this book circle agency book circle program was initiated basically to connect author uh, with the readers and uh, we have been doing this program since many years once again i extend a very hearty welcome to all of you and look forward to our eminent guest to know more about this subject and also about the book thank you very much this book would not have been possible without the initial grant which i got from icssr to organize a conference way back in 2016 you can imagine it takes couple of years to finally get the product out and especially a topic which is very important where the contribution of so many scholars in this volume you can when you see the Uh, contentless you will realize that there are very many senior scholars who have been you know contributing now uh, this is a very important topic as i said traditional and tribal healing practices and in fact this is one of the non codified systems we have all the other systems which are codified which have written texts which have professional knowledge which have degrees like biomedicine or ayurveda but folk tradition which are also called as traditional medicine or indigenous medicine or tribal healing herbal medicine all these are non codified which doesn't have any written text it is passed through generations to generation through oral traditions and most of these healers have this divine power to get into this profession and they learn through apprenticeship with the seniors in their own community and uh, this is all very experiential now when we say ethno medicine it is about the people the indigenous people who have the knowledge of the ecology the biodiversity and the rich knowledge which they possess about the trees the flora and the fauna around them make them uh, healers with lot of practice and they many of the times they perform on them, themselves and this is something which is learned over generations now uh, our focus was to do more with herbal medicine not really with shamanism or other faith healing so we restricted ourselves to you know, edit volume on uh, more of herbal healing which the traditional healers have been doing for ages now when we look at the whole hierarchy of knowledge biomedicine though came very late and ayurveda and traditional healing systems have been there for centuries we have not really recognized them ayush recognition also came in 1995 and later on but then if you look at 2005 and later on and still the folk medicine the folk healing practices the herbal healing are not recognized by the state though we have a small department in ayush but still uh, the kind of resources it needs is not yet done if you see there is a national institute of folk medicine pasighat it's a 50 bedded hospital but it is still not you know fully equipped to have patients and mostly there are four five healers who sit there and uh, managed by a director and one or two more doctors now uh, we have this traditionally rich resource by the healers who have the knowledge and most of these healers are above 60 years old you can imagine with the passing of these healers the whole lot of knowledge which is going away and especially about the trees the flora fauna around them which can take care of so many health issues and they are the ones who are at the door steps at the community level treating people day in and day out and all of them don't even charge any money very bare minimum token amount whatever you want to give them because their belief is that if they start charging their divine powers will go and the medicine will not work so this when you go across the country you will find these healers still very poor 
they most of them my own journey in the last couple of years in northeast most of them stay in huts and it was so interesting to do uh, the research in three states which IGNCA supported in 2019 where we have traveled to Sikkim Arunachal and Manipur they were living in the hut but their hearts were very big and they hosted us and it used to take the whole day to reach to one healer's hut we stayed there during the night and talked to them and you know document them and then they they also had lot of apprehensions i want to bring this point to your attention because they know that their knowledge is valuable and that now there is a renewed interest in their knowledge and lot of people are documenting both uh, audio visuals and especially also there is a project by ayush which documents uh, the audio visual practices of the healer especially the herbal medicine because there can be few new innovations which can help in uh, more of increasing the knowledge within the ayurveda itself so this project the two articles by dr shrikant and dr goel in this book talk about the the project but then when you talk to the healers they are apprehensive they feel that their knowledge is being taken away and they are not getting anything in written uh and our journey to towards all these states showed that they are so effective i mean there's always a controversy saying that they may be based on superstition and they, it's not scientific and it's not you no know, validated there is no research and development on this but since there are no resources that's why that has not been done but these are two different systems and it needs a different kind of r&d altogether but having a uh, national institute at pasighat very well one can track down the patients who are coming to these healers there is doc, there is a lady called ligo in northeast in uh, arunachal pradesh who everybody knows and there are patients coming not just from northeast but across the country and she has a facebook now thanks to the younger generation who are the children of these healers now have started using social media to promote their own parents healing systems and you can go to the page and see that how she treats and what is the response so it's always easy to document and see the efficacy of these herbal med medicines and it's not very difficult to document and see whether they are really effective or not so that exercise has to be done and in fact uh, in manipur there were very interesting cases one case was about the healer who only treats uh, kidney stones and in fact all these healers are also having their own specialization someone is a bone setter someone heals poison uh, healing somebody else does some other thing so this guy who is in uh, who got padma shri in for in fact because he treated so many patients with herbal healing for kidney stones and he kept all the pipettes behind his a uh, table to showcase the stones which he collected and jokingly he said three or four of his international patients couldn't send the stones after you know uh, whatever uh, treatment they have got and uh, another healer who sits in the morning at 9 and late at night uh, till 9 he charges only 100 rupees and in front of us the dcp even the governor used to come for treatment and he doesn't touch any patient with a cut or a blood he in fact treats all the internal injuries if there is a uh, slip disc or if there is any internal uh, problems with muscles or bones he himself was a, a pehlwan what we call and uh, he used to treat all of them and uh, with a small clinic of his own and he was very ambitious to start a clinic with Uh, where he can treat the stroke patients because stroke patients then get paralytic and he could treat them but then the only problem is that there are no resources so in one of our chapters we have written about herbal huts or healing huts because all these huts actually can be developed in the panchayat level or the we, government can help them to establish give medicines uh, in fact give them help in terms of scholarships for their younger generations and help them to grow their own medicinal plants in their nurseries so there are very many ways in which they can be helped also by giving technology like pounding machines or you know uh, dryers because they bring the medicines the herbal plants and they dry uh, sun dry but it takes a lot of time and they have all the crude methods but which can be updated so these are some of the ways in which many of these healers can be uh, you know 
supported. And very important because they are at the grassroots and they are the ones who are taking care of the primary level care. And uh, without them, many of the you know, uh, patients may not be able to reach the health centers which are far away or sometimes which are only restricted to three, four hours time. And these healers are at the doorstep, so they are in and out available for the uh, uh, communities. And most important is the community feeling that they do without being commercial, which actually makes them you know, very important stakeholders. And if we want to plan for any universal health coverage, I think it's very important to have these lakhs and lakhs of healers. And we have a pro process of certification. QCI certifies them, but it's voluntary. So why the healers will come forward? Because they're already doing their job. I don't think healers will be very much interested in no, uh, getting the certification at the age of 60 and 70, it may not really help them. So why not have a proactive way measures to certify them, especially the younger generations? So this book actually brings out very interesting papers by, as I said, by scientists, social scientists, uh, medical doctors, public health professionals, and also uh, the medical doctors. So it's very important to see what is the gist of the no, a book, and I would be very happy to hear from our distinguished experts and guests to know what can be the way forward, where it can go really into the policy making, and if Ministry of Ayush, Ministry of Tribal Affairs, and even Ministry of Forest and uh, other you know, uh, ministries can come together and see that this vast knowledge of the healers can really be harnessed, and their young generations can take this as a very important profession. And then that will help the communities to get the healing right at their door front. Otherwise, all this knowledge will go and we won't even know what is the tree all about and what is the rich resource that tree or the plant around them they have. So I think these are very important lessons which have come out of this book. And we'll be very happy to write a note or a letter to the concerned ministries and see that the healers get their due recognition and also the support so that they continue and we all can you know, achieve universal health coverage. Thank you. The moment we all will eagerly waiting for has arrived. I would request the dignitaries on the stage to formally launch the book. Now, this book would fall under the rubric of medical anthropology. And I'm an anthropologist, so I would like to say, start by saying giving you some idea about what anthropology is. And there is a great similarity between the philosophy of Pandit Din Dhyalupadhyay and anthropology. Pandit Din Dhyalupadhyay came up with the philosophy of Antodhya. And anthropology is actually Anto Adhyana. It is the study of the last person. And therefore, you will find that anthropologists would be mostly studying the tribal communities, the marginalized sections. If they are studying the you know, if my students are studying in Delhi, they would be studying a place called Patrachar Vidyale or some slum and this and that. So this is one uh, speci speciality of anthropology that primarily it talks to the people who are have-nots, it's the people who have no voice. And I think this particular book is about tribal healing practices, about all those people who are unknown, unsung, and uh, just, you know, like uh, overshadowed maybe, but they have their own humble knowledge system and they have been continuing with this knowledge system for centuries together. The second characteristic of anthropology is that it starts with A and ends with Y. So from A to Y, everything is in anthropology. And those who are a student of anthropology would know A for archaeological anthropology, B for biological anthropology, C for cultural anthropology, D for development anthropology, E for economic anthropology, like this, F for feminist anthropology, so you have anthropology. And one of the anthropology is medical anthropology. And medical anthropology, I must say, is again subdivided into 10, ten different, different sub-branches, sub but I'm not going into that. In 1976, I started learning medical anthropology. When I visited a village in, in Kashmir, in the Badgaon, Tehsil Badgaon, there is a village called Khanpura, where I studied their health, illness, and disease, and the practices about it. That is where I started. So it is nearly 47 years that I am, I am learning about medical anthropology, primarily 
about the beliefs and practices of people who are unseen, who are not to be seen, who are not prominently in front. Now, there is a association also of medical anthropologists in India. It is called Society for Medical Anthropology, SEMA. And uh, I think Sunita ji has chosen me, not because I am an author in this book, but uh, I am a president of the Society for Indian Medical Anthropology. And therefore, uh, I think I would like to uh, speak on this topic. Little bit, I would, won't take much of your time, but I have been given some time. So, firstly, I would say that in, 19, uh, in 2004, I edited a book, and that book was uh, titled Tribal Health and Medicine. And this book was reviewed in America by three prominent medical anthropologists. And one of the questions that was asked, so I had to, you know, they had uh, written uh, a review and I had to answer. One of the questions that they asked is, what is tribal medicine? And that was the time when I struck, you know, yes, really? What is tribal medicine? Or what is tribal? Because in anthropology, this is a misnomer that is going on. There is nothing like tribal. And I think, uh, rightly so, we have been at the national level, we are discussing, you know, whether some people can be named tribal. And can anthropologists name somebody as tribal? And there is a colonial hangover that is going on. So I had to clarify that when we, in, when India we say tribal, we actually mean a constitutional category, scheduled tribe. So we are not labeling somebody as, you know, tribal in, tribe in anthropological parlance is again a stage of development where some community is stuck with chieftainship. That is where the, where, where the tribal is used in anthropology. So it cannot be used for such a diverse category of people who are nearly more than 8% of India's population and they are from highly educated people, highly advanced people to PVTCs. So we cannot label them as tribal. And therefore, I think this particular term is again part of uh, debate, great debate. But I'm not going into that because uh, Professor Bajaj and myself, we have been discussing it now. And quite uh, rigorously we are discussing and we definitely would be coming up with more appropriate terms in the days to come. Now, I would like to, first of all, define what is medical anthropology. And I'm going to give my definition of medical anthropology because I have been given this opportunity, so I'll play my own trumpet. So I have defined in 2016 when this uh, conference was held, the same year I defined medical anthropology and for the benefit of uh, the you know, uh, audience. Medical anthropology investigates the issues related to health, illness, and disease from sociocultural, biocultural, eco-cultural and political economic perspective. It further strives to achieve an empowering, equitable and patient-oriented healthcare which is accessible, affordable besides conforming to patients' expectations. Now this is how in anthropology we look, we look at the problems that are to be seen, that are to be investigated, and the solutions for that to be sought at the person who is at the last stage, at the last, which is, of course, as I said, is somebody we are unable to see. And they are the ones living in slums, they are the ones living in the tribal areas, and they are, they are the ones where I think poverty plays a very, very important role. There was a book I remember, which was published in 1980, by Norwegian, Norwegian people, it was called Pills Against Poverty. Now, Pills Against Poverty was a very, very, I would say, uh, a kind of a satirical you know, title, where we are not looking at you know, uh, medical problems of people, but we are looking at poverty. And I think poverty is also, we, are, we have come to realize that poverty itself is like a medical problem. It is not only a matter of uh, of lack of resources, lack of money. In anthropology, there is a lot of literature where we have been talking about how poverty changes or orients your mindset so that you make, start making change, choices which may not be appropriate, which may not be rational. And 
that is what is not because of anything but because of the poverty which is a kind of a cultural uh, assemblies recently in 2022 in a journal called child pediatric there is a, a group of people from boston medical uh, center they have been working and they are talking of what is called as anti poverty medicine now they are saying that poverty affects biology and therefore you have to look at poverty as a medical problem so it is no more a kind of you know giving money to somebody you know like you can give money to somebody you can provide a source to somebody but what about the mindset what about the poverty as a as a as a mental panorama so this is what i would say that when we are trying to study tribal healing systems we should not only look at you know people who are disadvantaged groups but we should also look at their culture we should look at how their culture is benefiting them and also how the culture is also preventing them from you know both the things are there so when we study tribal communities we find that there are there are you know there are obvious problems like we have uh, vaccine vac vaccine hesitancy which is generally coming from these areas from the areas which are of interest to anthropologists now why these vaccine hesitancies are coming it is not only a question of that people are not aware people have have no they are ignorant no sometimes people know but still there is a mindset that is there we have to understand the mindset so if we have to change we have to change according to the mindset of the people now coming to you know uh, now i think little bit about ayush ministry which is actually uh, doing a commendable job they are they are the ones if uh, who are actually under the under the title of uh, local medical systems they are they are trying to document tribal uh, tribal medicines and madam shalja is sitting here she was a secretary ayush when i remember you know i was also part of that committee where uh, they were looking at you know this orthopedic you know especially in the in the in the in the, in the ground in the grassroots you know orthopedicians and all of these people from all india came so ayush is doing a very good job and i think uh, sunita ji has rightly said that in pasighat arunachal pradesh we have got a uh, you know folk medicine institute national institute of folk medicine but unfortunately what is happening you know ius is also uh, i would say is dominating the tribal systems and there there is a there is a phenomena that i would like to i i am talking about and i have written also it's called ayusization so ayusization is going on because you have you have for a very long time allopathy you know dominating over ayurveda but then you have a resurgence of ayush and you have uh, indigenous and traditional medical systems now what is happening is ayush is dominating over the tribal healing systems and this is happening and i can tell you in 2012 when this institute was opened it was called national institute of folk medicine now it is called northeastern institute of ayurveda and folk medicine so ayurveda has already you know set in there so i would say that you know like these systems should not be you know i would say no dominated by any other system and they should be studied first of all documented as independent systems in themselves and i think it is uh, the government of india is of course starting from very good uh, idea, uh, starting from northeast but on their own i think uh, these healers uh, tribal healers are organizing themselves one of my student who is a santhal she worked among the of course santhal and she said that they are coming up with a with a you know system of medicine they call it as holopathy now holo is a holo means man human beings a uh, birhod you know birhod you must have heard of birhod birhod means forest man so they are coming up with a with, with a, they are calling it as a, a system uh, that they are teaching to the uh, budding santhal as part of their culture identity and all those things they call it holopathy similarly in uh, in rajasthan there is a in udaipur particularly there is a uh, organization called uh, rashtriya guni mission now rashtriya guni mission is again an attempt by these healers these folk healers to organize themselves and to also standardize themselves so what i am trying to say is there are two things that are going on at the grassroots level these healers are because of again uh, globalization because of all kinds of internet and all these things that are that that are influencing them they are organizing themselves but at the same time government of india is also trying to you know set in emotion but that is actually again 
I would say, I would, as an anthropologist, I would say that let folk medicines be developed as folk medicines, not as subordinate to Ayurveda, not as subordinate to Yunani, not as subordinate to Siddha or uh, Soarikpa, whatever uh, systems are there. They are, they are, they are, basically these systems are medical systems, I would say. They are tribal healing systems or medical systems. And when I say systems, I am not talking of that they are only consisting of plant medicines. They are systems means they have a full-fledged curative system, they have a full-fledged preventive, promotive, and diagnostic. All elements, all the branches of, of medical science are there in, in these systems as well. And therefore, we have to uh, look at them from that point of view. Now, uh, Sunita ji has said that in this particular book, they have emphasized upon plant medicines. In fact, WHO in 1975 came up with, under Bannerman, they came up with traditional medical system program where they emphasized on two things. One is the plant medicine, another was TBA, traditional bulk at attendance. What I would like to call as ethnogynecologists, you know, I would not like to call them as attendants, birth attendants. They are ethnogynecologists. They also have a very important knowledge. And see, mentioned about Professor R.K. Mutatkar. Professor R.K. Mutatkar did a study in, in Pune among the gynecologists of Pune. And she asked them, you know, when you were pregnant, what you did? Did you follow your gynecology books? Or you follow your, your, sas, kya bolte so? Sas kya bolte? Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, you know. Mother-in-law. And all of them, 100% of them, they said that they followed their mother-in-law. So why they followed their mother-in-law? They are all so, you know, well-versed with the, with the minor nuances of, of, of gynecology. Why they have to? Because, you know, there is a difference between disease and illness. Disease is what a doctor would tell you. But illness is an experience. And they are two different. There is a person called Eisenberg. He said, people suffer illness, doctor treats disease. So doctor will treat disease, but people suffer illness. And therefore, these traditional systems, including tribal healing systems, they are based on experience, experience of generations and generations. They are valuable from that point. They are not experiment-based. Science is experiment-based, but this folk science is experience-based. And this experience is of generations, and this experience is very valuable. So it must be documented. I, I agree with you. And government of India is very now, right from, madam, your time, I know from your time only, you were all trying, to, we were trying to have evidence base for Ayurveda from that time only on, onwards. So we should try to have this evidence base also with these tribal, tribal systems, evidence base. I give you one example, you know, I was working among the Tharus. There is a place called Chandan Chauki. So I was, I was talking to a bone setter. Now this bone setter was, uh, I was talking, he said, what do you do? He said, I use this bark of a tree. Uh, there is a tree called Maida tree. He said, I use the bark of tree. And my patients, when I, whenever I use it, I put, a, you know, around that, uh, bone uh, fracture, and it, it heals. I said, how do you know? How do I believe you? You know, I said, you know, I wanted to be sure. I said, how do I believe you? He said, come, come with me. He took me around. He said, these are all Maida trees. All of them have been used by me, all the bark. And there was hundreds of trees with, without bark. And the bark was used by him. He said, if it was not uh, effective, why would people have come to me and why would I take it again? So this is again, you know, like based on his experience. Now this particular plant, this particular bark, needs to be, of course, studied and needs to be put to scientific, you know, scrutiny, evidence base, and then we can definitely. There is a lot of exper experience that people have gained over generations, hundred and hundred years. This experience is there, you know. When you come up, come with a, you know, like one of my friend is uh, Professor Rawat, a chemistry. He has uh, come up with a molecule. This molecule is uh, now being used for Parkinson's disease. Now this molecule, this is one single molecule, but this single molecule, to come to that single molecule, they have to experiment thousands and thousands, and then they can get this single molecule. So it's such a difficult thing. Now this tribal, suppose, suppose this particular person, he has, he has been using this for generations together, they have been using Maida tree. Now this Maida tree must be having something. So this, will, this kind of knowledge will help us in scrutinizing and, and, and selecting those, those potent 
you know, uh, plants and, and uh, medicines, which then can be, you know, experimented. Otherwise, we will go in wilderness and, and so therefore, uh, what I would like to say here is that there are, of course, these IPR issues. And IPR issues are very, very important issues. And I think anthropologists are also very much concerned. So traditional knowledge of plant-based medicine of the Shirul tribe of India has been a matter of great concern as there is a real danger of unscrupulous drug dealers taking away this precious knowledge for commercial exploitation. The Shidul tribe communities, which has been the custodian of this knowledge for centuries, would be devoid of its legitimate profit, which will unlawfully go to the biopirates. This is becoming a real danger because there is worldwide search for the indigenous medicine as an alternative to side effect prone biomedicine at a time when the global market for herbal drugs is of 43 billion US dollars, there is a cutthroat competition for seeking new and pristine knowledge about the tribal medicines in a situation where only one out of 1,000 molecules come out to be of medicinal use. Knowing from the Shirul tribe is definitely going to save a lot of money for a drug company. Already people in America and Japan have filed patents for known Indian medicinal plants like Ashwagandha, Kala, Jira, Kumar, Amaltas, etc. The Shidul tribes of India has been using a large number of plants for many diseases and there is a real danger of this knowledge getting pirated. There is a need to carefully protect and the intellectual property enshrined in the tribal medicines so that its commercial profits are shared by the tribals who are the real owners of the medicines. And I'm very glad to tell you that in, at least in, in the state of Kerala, this has been shown to be successful experiment and this needed to be you know, taken, together, taken to other areas in Northeast you have got you know, North is again heaven for biodiversity and there's so many plants and so much of knowledge that is, you know, there. This needs to be harnessed and then profit needs to be again shared with the people who, who were the custodians of that knowledge. I think that would be the real. So with these words, uh, I'm grateful to all of you that you listen to my all kinds of things that I, I you know, spoke here. Thank you very much. So the book, as they have told you, is about uh, uh, what is being called uh, ethnomedicine and uh, healing practices in the uh, tribal uh, part of India or tribal India. And uh, uh, I have looked at the list of contributors and the topics. It covers, in this particular field of anthropology, it covers a very wide uh, uh, canvas. And uh, P.C. Joshi himself has contributed, he's the doyen of medical uh, anthropologists, health anthropologists of India. And uh, I, have, I have recognized many of the names, and they come from very different fields, very different experiences they must have brought together. So I'm sure that this book in the field of medical anthropology is going to be a overwhelming, that's the word you used, contribution. That I'm, I'm certain. Uh, so within the scholarship of anthropology, medical anthropology, it is indeed a major contribution. Uh, but they, uh, what Sunita is trying to do is not only, not only contribute to the field of medical anthropology, she also uh, wants to uh, propose certification, recognition, integration of this uh, 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 indigenous ethno practices. I don't know where do we integrate them, but that's one of the, those things that uh, is attempted. And not words like, uh, he said tribal, that also we should consider sometime more seriously, but a term like ethno, uh, we have been saying that we have completed 75 years of independence. And uh, um, after 75 years, we have also said that we have taken these five uh, great resolutions for the Amrit Kala. And one of the, uh, those resolutions is, or two of those resolutions, one of them is to be proud of your heritage and the, another one is that we will, in these 25 years, cleanse our minds of all traces of slavery, 
which we were subjected to before independence. And the cleansing our mind also means uh, that we, we be careful about words which we have been, which we have inherited from our, our past. And this is not merely to do with words. When you, when you stop thinking of tribals as tribals, when you stop thinking of the tribal medicine as ethnomedicine or ethnogynecology, you start thinking of it as people, our brothers, and this medicine as medicine, and this then, then you approach it differently. You approach it very differently. Uh, it is not exotic to you. It is not others that we are, uh, we are and, and that's extremely important. Let me see, my, uh, I, I couldn't have expressed my anger in 1978, when I came across that professor, today I want to express my anger. Okay? Because I, have, I am the chairman of ICSR, perhaps I have earned the right to express that anger. Uh, uh, that was one thing I wanted to share. There's another. And while sitting here, I went through some pages of this book. And one of the concepts which is being talked about is, uh, which, is uh, dip, which the editors have depended upon to organize things, is that of the great tradition and the little tradition. Now, this is another, uh, this, uh, this talk of great tradition, little tradition uh, came into currency when we, were doing, we had started looking at Indian science. It was around the same time. This came into currency. And I remember having had uh, several discussions with uh, Ashish Nandi and telling him what is this that you're talking about. Because as far as we understand, there's nothing like a little tradition in India or a great tradition. There is a, there's a, in the West, there is that, uh, that uh, dichotomy between the, the people and the uh, between the citizens and non-citizens. Well, after all, the number of citizens in England would, would have been very limited. All the others were slaves in a way. And so there was a great tradition and there was a little tradition. India doesn't have that. Uh, if any one of you, I'm, I'm sure there are many here who would have, uh, if you've seriously read through, say, the texts of Ayurveda, uh, have, are there many who have? Uh, read through Tarak Samhita, read through Sushut Samhita, read through Madhav Nidanam, or whatever. Uh, you will realize that much of what they are writing down in both Dravyaguna parts of the text and the Chikitsa parts of the text much of it, perhaps a very large part of it, is what we call folk. Uh, and they keep saying all the time that uh, we are only systematizing what is uh, with the knowledge which is there. And that is the Indian position all the time, that the Shastra only systematizes which is already there in the loka. It doesn't create the loka. While the Western way is different of thinking of these things, the West, it doesn't create the loka. It systematizes what is there in the loka. And uh, these Ayurvedic texts are of such uh, openness on this. Of course, they repeatedly say that uh, when you come across a new, uh, uh, new herb or a new biological product, uh, you ask, consult the vanavasis there, ask them what it is and what its dravya gunas are. And uh, uh, it will even say, uh, the doctor, these, all these uh, classifications we keep making, there is this vayu and uh, kapha and uh, these are the for, for the purposes of for 
compiling these things, putting this codifying as you use, but it's not codifying is what they mean. But in practice, if you find, and practice will mean your own practice as well as the practice in loka, that uh, uh, that particular drug or some does not follow. It is behaving in a way different than what your Shastra is telling you. That is, a, 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 the, your Shastra is telling you that is a kapha karak drug, is a kapha drug. And you use it and you find the kapha is actually decreasing. Then you trust your eyes and trust the practice. Do not trust your Shastra. That is the kind of Shastra we have and cannot become a great tradition. It, here, what you call the great tradition, and we call the little tradition, they're largely intermingled. Uh, and we should, we should be aware of that. If you really want to start looking at Indian reality as it is, we should be aware of that, and not uh, put Ayurveda as the great tradition, and these folk practitioners as the little tradition. We are not that. We are not that. that. Uh, I want to say something else. Uh, if we do not call this ethnomedicine, what do we call it? Uh, folk is not a good term. Because folk has all, those, all that uh, uh, baggage of the West. In fact, the German folk will be even worse term. Uh, the VOLK will be even worse than, than FOLK from where FOLK comes. Uh, so what do you call it? So one of course we you call it uh, Lok Svasthya, Lok Svasthya Parampara, uh, which has been used very widely, or uh, Lok Aushad. Uh, you, you can, I'm not saying use this, but that's one possibility. But there's a better way. In fact, I was just reading the definition. Currently, the way ethnic is used in different parts of the world. And uh, say if you are in America, and uh, if you call the, uh, for the Americans, the blacks, the Latin, Latinos, the Puerto Ricans, are all ethnic. But if you use the term ethnic for them, it will be taken as a pejorative. So you do not call uh, black art as ethnic art. You, not, you do not call black cuisine as ethnic cuisine. But you can call it black cuisine. You can call it Latin cuisine, Latin art. So why don't we, instead of saying this, we, we talk about bhi laoshad. We talk about Gond Aushad Parampara or, or Santhal Aushad Parampara or uh, in that Pasigat, it could be Nishi uh, Aushad Parampara. When you do that, uh, when you start looking at this tradition not as a Atsno tradition, but as a Bhil tradition or a Nishi tradition, or a Santhal tradition, or as a Munda tradition. Give them the name they have. They have an identity. And then you will find uh, that to understand the Munda tradition of doing things, you will have to know more than their Aushad. You will have to know them. How do they use it? In what context they use it? Uh, what Sharandar Samsutas goes in such great detail that if you have to collect an herb, what is the uh, discipline you follow before you go about collecting it? All these nishis will have their own discipline of how to, how to go to the forest and how to collect the herb. In what season, what time of the day, what kind of puja you do before you before you dare to touch. We have to, we will think of recording those things also when we, when we start thinking of as a valuable tradition of the Nishis or of the Mundas. 
something more. When you, when you see that they're using this herb and you really sit with them, they'll also tell you that why are they using this particular herb for this particular purpose? They'll give you the, their conceptual framework through which it, uh, their medicine operates. And that conceptual framework, and I am very sure, will be very near the Ayurvedic framework that we have. Because Ayurvedic framework has evolved from there rather than it being the other way around. It's not the Ayurvedic framework which has been imposed upon them. It's the, at least that's the text claim that our framework is what we have looked at how people look at these things and that is what we have put together. I think we have to start making anthropology the study of ourselves and not the study of others. And that study will be possible when Say, if you're doing medicine, don't start doing medicine through medi anthropological through medicine without having some understanding of the Shastra of Indian medicine. If you, if you, if you know that Ayurvedic text, then only you'll know what Nishi is doing, what the Bhil is doing. If you do not know the text, what will you know? Anyway, let me close at this. Let me pay my respects. It's a very interesting book, and uh, I'm sure it will give much more thought uh, in within uh, medical anthropology, uh, much more will be done. Uh, thank you very much for calling me. Thanks. First of all, I congratulate Sunita Reddiji for a very constructive intervention in an area which remains untouched, unresearched. Therefore, this is a great work. Lekin jo sawal abhi PC Joshi ji aur Bajaj ji ne uthaya hai, उसके आईने में हमें जवाब मिलना चाहिए। पीसी जोशी जी ने एक बहुत ही फंडामेंटल क्वेश्चन उठाया था कि ट्राइबल वर्ड के यूज पे। 1872 में हमारा सेंसस शुरू हुआ ब्रिटिश गवर्नमेंट के दौरान। हम सबको पढ़ना चाहिए वो सेंसस अगर समय मिले तो। मैंने समय निकालकर 1872 से लेकर 1941 का सेंसस पढ़ा उसका शॉर्ट नोट्स बनाया बुक लिखने चला था लेकिन पॉलिटिक्स में आ गया तो नोट्स रखा रह गया समय मिलेगा उसको बुक में डालूंगा आश्चर्य तो यह है कि बहुत से सेंसस 1872 का सेंसस जो फर्स्ट सेंसस था वो भारत के कई मुश्किल से मिलेगा आपको कई पुस्तकालय में है भी नहीं 1881 का सेंसस भी मुश्किल से मिलता है बाद के सेंसस को कुछ प्राइवेट पब्लिकेशन ने पब्लिश किया लेकिन जो मैं बात कहना चाहता हूं 1872 से लेकर 1911 तक एनिमिस्ट वर्ड का यूज किया जाता था और देयर इज ग्रेट डेलिबरेशंस इन द सेंसस रिपोर्ट्स बाय द सेंसस कमिश्नर्स एंड सेंसस सुपरिटेंडेंट्स अबाउट द नेचर वैल्यू ऑफ लाइफ material condition, spirituality of the community, those who are in the forest or in Plato's. 1921, they started using tribal. And I think not less than 40 to 45 pages are dedicated on the issue of tribal, why they have not using now, they stopped using the term animist and now using tribal. लेकिन अब ट्राइबल शब्द उनकी आइडेंटिटी बन गई है आज यदि उनको आप कहेंगे कि आप ट्राइबल शब्द से हट जाएं तो एक दूसरी ही समस्या पैदा होगी जो बजाज साहब ने उठाया बहुत ही वैलिड क्वेश्चन उठाया उस क्वेश्चन को ऑलरेडी 1931 में प्रोफेसर केसी भट्टाचार्य ने आस्तोस मेमोरियल लेक्चर जो उन्होंने कलकत्ता में दिया था उसमें रिजॉल्व किया था दैट इज द स्वराज इन आईडिया व्हिच is being articulated at decolonization of the mind. The whole fight was against the British Samarajji. When the fight is only for political power, then the people of the village, like Urisa's 12-year-old Baji Raut, or like the 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 Baji Raut,
सात बच्चे जो जिसमें चार नाइन्थ क्लास के बच्चे थे रामानंद राम गोविंद सतीश प्रसाद एंड जगतपति देर वेर ऑल फ्रॉम द नाइन्थ क्लास तिलेश्वरी बरुआ सी वॉज ट्वेल्व ईयर ओल्ड इन गुवाहाटी एंड सरीश कुमार मेहता वो वॉज फिफ्टीन ईयर ओल्ड शायद वे फ्रीडम मूवमेंट में नहीं आते दे वे नॉट फाइटिंग फॉर द पोलिटिकल पावर दे वे फाइटिंग फॉर जिसको हिंदी में कहते हैं अस्मिता की लड़ाई लड़ रहे थे इंडिजीनियस जो ट्रेडिशन है हमारी अपनी जो स्वायत्तता है वो अपने पॉलिटिकल पावर को रीआर्टिकुलेट कर रहे थे हमारी अपनी स्वायत्तता में ऑटोनॉमी में और उसी को हम सूक्ष्म संस्कृति कहते हैं इसलिए आपको हम सबको आश्चर्य होता है कि हम किसी डिस्ट्रिक्ट में रहते हैं उसी डिस्ट्रिक्ट में थ्री फोर किलोमीटर्स के बाद सब डिवीजन बनने के बाद टोन और डायलेक्ट्स बदल जाता है यदि हम उनको यूनिफाई करना चाहेंगे तो एक बाइनरी क्रिएट हो जाता है और हम आराम से उस टोन और डायलेक्ट्स के साथ अपने आप को एडजस्ट करते हैं तो डाइवर्सिटीज इज एसेंस ऑफ इंडिया उस डाइवर्सिटीज को समझने के लिए एक मेंटल कंडीशन होना चाहिए अनलेस अनटिल यू हैव दैट मेंटल कंडीशंस आप उस डाइवर्सिटीज को समझ नहीं सकते हैं आत्मसात नहीं कर सकते उस डाइवर्सिटीज के कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स को आप बता तो देंगे लेकिन जब डाइवर्सिटीज से इनकाउंटर होगा जिसको हिंदी में कहते हैं साक्षात्कार होगा तो फिर हम ट्राइबल के कॉन्टेक्स्ट में मैं कहूँ वो एकेडमिक्स में सब्जेक्ट हैं and politics me object they have become the subjects and objects that is the reason ki hum hamesha secondary sources ke aadhar par tribal ko dekhte hain sochte hain explain explain karte hain aur independence ke seven decades ke baad isliye is book ka importance hai ki isne secondary sources ke barrier ko toda hai और वहाँ पहुँचने की कोशिश की है इसलिए अगेन आई कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट सुनीता रेड्डी जिन ऑल दी ऑथर्स आप सब से मेरा निवेदन है और ये मेरा सजेशन है कि हम जितनी जल्दी अपने रूट्स पे आ जाएं, रिकनेक्ट हो जाएं, उतना जल्दी भारत स्वतंत्र होगा अभी भी हम यूरोसेंट्रिक हैं तो डिपार्चर फ्रॉम यूरोसेंट्रिज्म वुड बी अनदर इंडिपेंडेंस ऑफ भारत थैंक यू सर मैं आपको कुछ अपडेट करना चाहूँगा जो आपने सारे सजेशंस दिए आई जी एन सी एज हैविंग ए रीजनल सेंटर इन गुवाहाटी विच इज़ वर्किंग फॉर ट्राइबल इश्यूज वेरियस काइंड ऑफ एक्टिविटीज ट्राइबल कल्चर एंड ऑल काइंड ऑफ एक्टिविटीज ऑन ट्राइबल इश्यूज और जो आपने अभी ट्राइबल uh, के साथ आई थिंक सुनीता रेड्डी जी को याद है हम लोगों ने सर ट्राइबल हीलर्स के साथ मणिपुर में एक बहुत बड़ा वर्कशॉप किया था और उन्हीं को सब सारे स्पीकर्स वही थे और वो बहुत एक सक्सेसफुल मॉडल था हमारे लिए तो आज जो भी आप सब लोगों ने सजेशंस दिए हैं हमारी एजेंसी की जितने भी प्रोग्राम्स और एक्टिविटीज़ हैं चाहे वो ट्राइबल कल्चर को लेके हो ट्राइबल लैंग्वेजेस को लेके सर तो रांची में भी हमारा एक सेंटर है एक गुवाहाटी में है और ये दोनों सेंटर स्पेसिफिकली ट्राइबल कल्चर और ट्राइबल इशूज़ को ले ही हम लोग फोकस्ड हैं और आज जो भी सजेशन्स हम मिले हैं डेफिनेटली That will help uh, in our various programs and activities. So, uh, with these words, I we know we are already uh, running late. I would like to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to all eminent speakers for their kind, valuable time and uh, valuable guidance and suggestions. And uh, we look forward to your continued support and guidance in various uh, projects of IGNC. And thank you all for your kind presence. Uh, please continue to. bless us and uh, connect with ignc in various programs and activities this healer uh, practices of uh, healing practices in india we have projects survey and documentation of healing practices which is which is uh, one part is over second part will start soon and in this we we aim to have a at least database of healer in india and also to various kind of uh, documenting various kind of healing practices along with raising various kind of issues of healers in terms of recognition and also connecting this uh, our traditional science with modern science with these words thank you very much and we look forward to meeting you again in some other program Thanks.